Anthony Neil Wedgwood Ben, the 3rd of April 1925 to the 14th of March 2014, originally known as Anthony Wedgwood Ben, but later as Tony Ben, was a British politician, writer, and diarist. He was a member of Parliament MP for 47 years between the 1950 and 2001 general elections and a cabinet minister in the Labour governments of Harold Wilson and James Callaghan in the 1960s and 1970s. Originally a moderate, he was identified as being on the party's hard left from the early 1980s, and was widely seen as a key proponent of democratic socialism within the party. Ben inherited a peerage on his father's death as second Viscount Stansgate, which prevented his continuing as an MP. He fought to remain in the House of Commons, and then campaigned for the ability to renounce the title, a campaign which succeeded with the Peerage Act 1963. He was an active member of the Fabian Society and was its chair from 1964 until 1965. In the Labour government of 1964-70 he served first as Postmaster General, where he oversaw the opening of the Post Office Tower, and later as a technocratic. Minister of Technology, he served as chairman of the Labour Party in 1971-72 while in opposition, and in the Labour government of 1974-1979, he returned to the cabinet, initially as Secretary of State for Industry, before being made Secretary of State for Energy, retaining his post when James Callaghan replaced Wilson as Prime Minister. When the Labour Party was again in opposition through the 1980s, he emerged as a prominent figure on its left wing in the term, Benite came into currency as someone associated with radical left-wing politics. He unsuccessfully challenged Neil Kinnock for the Labour leadership in 1988. Ben was described as one of the few UK politicians to have become more left-wing after holding ministerial office. After leaving Parliament, Ben was president of the Stop the War Coalition from 2001 until his death in 2014. Early life and family Ben was born in Westminster, London on 3 April 1925. He had two brothers, Michael 1921 who was killed in the Second World War, and David 1928 a specialist in Russia and Eastern Europe. After the Thames flood in January 1928 their house was uninhabitable so the Benn family moved to Scotland for over 12 months. Their father, William Wedgwood Benn, was a Liberal Member of Parliament from 1906 who crossed the floor to the Labour Party in 1928 and was appointed Secretary of State for India by Ramsay MacDonald in 1929, a position he held until the Labour Party's landslide electoral defeat in 1931. William Benn was elevated to the House of Lords and Tony Benn was subsequently titled with the honorific prefix, the Honourable. William Benn was given the title of Viscount Stansgate in 1942. The new wartime coalition government was short of working Labour peers in the upper house. In 1945-46, William Benn was the Secretary of State for Air in the first majority Labour government. Benn's mother, Margaret Wedgwood Benn, nay Holmes, 1897 to 1991, was a theologian, feminist, and the founder president of the Congregational Federation. She was a member of the League of the Church Militant, which was the predecessor of the movement for the ordination of women. In 1925, she was rebuked by Randall Davidson, the Archbishop of Canterbury, for advocating the ordination of women. His mother's theology had a profound influence on Ben, as she taught him that the stories in the Bible were based around the struggle between the prophets and the kings and that he ought in his life to support the prophets over the kings, who had power, as the prophets taught righteousness. Ben asserted that the teachings of Jesus Christ had a radical political importance on his life, and made a distinction between the historical Jesus as a carpenter of Nazareth, who advocated social justice and egalitarianism and the way in which he's presented by some religious authorities, by popes, archbishops and bishops who present Jesus as justification for their power." Believing this to be a gross misunderstanding of the role of Jesus. He believed that it was a great mistake to assume that the teachings of Christianity are outdated in modern Britain, and Higgins wrote in the Ben Inheritance that Ben was a socialist whose political commitment owes much more to the teaching of Jesus than the writing of Marx. Later in his life, Ben emphasized issues regarding morality and righteousness, as well as various ethical principles of nonconformism. I've never thought we can understand the world we lived in unless we understood the history of the Church. 
Ben said to the Catholic Herald, "...all political freedoms were won, first of all, through religious freedom. Some of the arguments about the control of the media today, which are very big arguments, are the arguments that would have been fought in the religious wars. You have the satellites coming in now, well, it is the multinational church all over again." That's why Mrs. Thatcher pulled Britain out of UNESCO, she was not prepared, any more than Ronald Reagan was, to be part of an organization that talked about a new world information order, people speaking to each other without the help of Murdoch or Maxwell." According to Peter Wilby in The New Statesman, Ben, "...decided to do without the paraphernalia and doctrine of organized religion but not without the teachings of Jesus." Although Ben became more agnostic as he became older, he was intrigued by the interconnections between Christianity, radicalism and socialism. Wilby also wrote in The Guardian that although former Chancellor Stafford Cripps described Ben as, "...as keen a Christian as I am myself," Ben wrote in 2005 that he was, "...a Christian agnostic," who believed, "...in Jesus the prophet, not Christ the king," specifically rejecting the label of, "...humanist." Both of Ben's grandfathers were Liberal Party MPs, his paternal grandfather was John Ben, a successful politician, MP for Tower Hamlets and later Devonport, who was created a baronet in 1914 and who founded a publishing company, Ben Brothers, and his maternal grandfather was Daniel Holmes, MP for Glasgow Govan. Ben's contact with leading politicians of the day, dates back to his earliest years. He met Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald when he was five years old, whom he described as a kindly old gentleman who leaned over me and offered me a chocolate biscuit. I've looked at Labour leaders in a funny way ever since." Ben also met former Liberal Prime Minister David Lloyd George when he was 12, and later recalled that, while still a boy, he once shook hands with Mahatma Gandhi, in 1931, while his father was Secretary of State for India. During the Second World War, Ben joined and trained with the Home Guard from the age of 16, later recalling in a speech made in 2009. I could use a bayonet, a rifle, a revolver, and if I'd seen a German officer having a meal I'd have tossed a grenade through the window. Would I have been a freedom fighter or a terrorist?" In July 1943, Ben enlisted in the Royal Air Force as an aircraftman second class. His father and elder brother Michael who was later killed in an accident were already serving in the RAF. He was granted an emergency commission as a pilot officer on probation on 10 March 1945. As a pilot officer, Ben served as a pilot in South Africa and Rhodesia. He relinquished his commission with effect from 10 August 1945, three months after the Second World War ended in Europe on 8 May, and just days before the war with Japan ended on 2 September. After attending Mr. Gladstone's Day School near Sloane Square, Ben attended Westminster School, and studied at New College, Oxford, where he read philosophy, politics and economics and was elected president of the Oxford Union in 1947. In later life, Ben removed public references to his private education from Who's Who. In 1970, all references to Westminster School were removed. In the 1975 edition, his entry stated, Education still in progress. In the 1976 edition, almost all details were omitted save for his name, jobs as a member of parliament, and as a government minister, an address. The publishers confirmed that Ben had sent back the draft entry with everything else struck through. In the 1977 edition, Ben's entry disappeared entirely, and when he returned to Who's Who in 1983, he was listed as Tony Ben, and all references to his education or service record were removed. In 1972, Ben said in his diaries that, Today I had the idea that I would resign my privy councillorship, my MA, and all my honorary doctorates in order to strip myself of what the world had to offer, while he acknowledged that he might be ridiculed. For doing so, Ben said that Wedgie Ben and the RT Honorable Anthony Wedgwood Ben and all that stuff is impossible. I have been Tony Ben in Bristol for a long time. In October 1973, he announced on BBC Radio that he wished to be known as Mr. Tony Ben rather than Anthony Wedgwood Ben, and his book Speeches from 1974 is credited to Tony Ben. Despite this name change, social historian Alwyn W. Turner writes that just as those with an agenda to pursue still call Muhammad Ali by his original name.
So most newspapers continued to refer to Tony Benn as Wedgwood Benn, or Wedgie in the case of the tabloids. For years to come, Benn met Caroline Middleton de Camp, born the 13th of October 1926, Cincinnati, Ohio, United States, over tea at Worcester College, Oxford, in 1949, and just nine days after meeting her, he proposed to her on a park bench in the city. Later, he bought the bench from Oxford City Council and installed it in the garden of their home in Holland Park. Tony and Caroline had four children, Stephen, Hilary, Melissa, a feminist writer, and Joshua, and ten grandchildren. Caroline Benn died of cancer on of November 2000, aged 74, after a career as an educationalist. Two of Benn's children have been active in Labour Party politics. His eldest son Stephen was an elected member of the Inner London Education Authority from 1986 to 1990. His second son Hilary was a councillor in London, stood for Parliament in 1983 and 1987, and becoming Labour MP for Leeds Central in 1999. He was Secretary of State for International Development from 2003 to 2007, and then Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs until 2010, later serving as Shadow Foreign Secretary 2015-16. This makes him the third generation of his family to have been a member of the cabinet, a rare distinction for a modern political family in Britain. Ben's granddaughter Emily Ben was the Labour Party's youngest ever candidate when she failed to win East Worthing and Shoreham in 2010. Ben was a first cousin once removed of the actress Margaret Rutherford. Ben and his wife Caroline became vegetarian in 1970, for ethical reasons, and remained so for the rest of their lives. Ben cited the decision of his son Hillary to become vegetarian as an important factor in his own decision to adopt a vegetarian diet. <laughs> Early parliamentary career Member of Parliament, 1950–1960 Following the Second World War, Ben worked briefly as a BBC radio producer. On 1 November 1950, he was selected to succeed Stafford Cripps as the Labour candidate for Bristol South East, after Cripps stood down because of ill health. He won the seat in a by-election on 30 November 1950. Anthony Crossland helped him get the seat as he was the MP for nearby South Gloucestershire at the time. Upon taking the oath on 4 December 1950 Ben became baby of the house, the youngest MP, for one day, being succeeded by Thomas Teven, who was two years younger but took his oath a day later. He became the baby again in 1951, when Teven was not re-elected. In the 1950s, Ben held middle-of-the-road or soft-left views, and was not associated with the young left-wing group around Anurin Bevan. As MP for Bristol South East, Ben helped organize the 1963 Bristol bus boycott against the color bar of the Bristol Omnibus Company against employing black British and British Asian drivers. Ben said that he would, "...stay off the buses, even if I have to find a bike." And Labour leader Harold Wilson also told an anti-apartheid rally in London he was, Glad that so many Bristolians are supporting the boycott campaign. Adding that he wish Ed them every success. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Peerage reform. Ben's father was created Viscount Stansgate in 1942 when Winston Churchill increased the number of Labour peers to aid political work in the House of Lords. At this time, Ben's elder brother Michael was intending to enter the priesthood and had no objections to inheriting a peerage. However, Michael was later killed in an accident while on active service in the Second World War, and this left Ben as the heir to the peerage. He made several unsuccessful attempts to renounce the succession. In November 1960, Lord Stansgate died. Ben automatically became a peer, preventing him from sitting in the House of Commons. The Speaker of the Commons, Sir Harry Hilton Foster, did not allow him to deliver a speech from the bar of the House of Commons in April 1961 when the by-election was being called. Continuing to maintain his right to abandon his peerage, Ben fought to retain his seat in a by-election caused by his succession on 4 May 1961. Although he was disqualified from taking his seat, he was re-elected. An election court found that the voters were fully aware that Ben was disqualified, and declared the seat won by the Conservative runner up, Malcolm St. Clair, who was at the time also the heir presumptive to a peerage. Ben continued his campaign outside Parliament. 
Within two years, though, the conservative government of the time, which had members in the same or similar situation to Benz i.e., who were going to receive title, or who had already applied for writs of summons, changed the law. The Peerage Act 1963, allowing lifetime disclaimer of peerages, became law shortly after 6 p.m. on 31 July 1963. Ben was the first peer to renounce his title, doing so at 6.22 p.m. that day. St. Clair, fulfilling a promise he had made at the time of his election, then accepted the office of steward of the Manor of Northstead, disqualifying himself from the House outright resignation not being possible. Ben returned to the Commons after winning a by-election on 20 August 1963. In government, 1964–1970 In the 1964 government led by Harold Wilson, Ben was postmaster general, where he oversaw the opening of the post office tower, then the UK's tallest building, and the creations of the post bus service and gyrobank. He proposed issuing stamps without the sovereign's head, but this met with private opposition from the Queen. Instead, the portrait was reduced to a small profile in silhouette, a format that is still used on commemorative stamps. Ben also led the government's opposition to the pirate radio stations broadcasting from international waters, which he was aware would be an unpopular measure. Some of these stations were causing problems, such as interference to emergency radio used by shipping, although he was not responsible for introducing the Marine Broadcasting Offences Bill when it came before Parliament at the end of July 1966 for its first reading. Earlier in the month, Ben was promoted to Minister of Technology, which included responsibility for the development of Concord and the formation of International Computers Limited ICL. The period also saw government involvement in industrial rationalisation, and the merger of several car companies to form British Leyland. Following Conservative MP Enoch Powell's 1968, Rivers of Blood, speech to a Conservative Association meeting, in opposition to Harold Wilson's insistence on not stirring up the Powell issue, Ben said during the 1970 general election campaign, the flag of racialism which has been hoisted in Wolverhampton is beginning to look like the one that fluttered 25 years ago over Dachau and Belsen. If we do not speak up now against the filthy and obscene racialist propaganda, the forces of hatred will mark up their first success and mobilize their first offensive. Enoch Powell has emerged as the real leader of the Conservative Party. He is a far stronger character than Mr. Heath. He speaks his mind, Heath does not. The final proof of Powell's power is that Heath dare not attack him publicly, even when he says things that disgust decent conservatives. The mainstream press attacked Ben for using language deemed as intemperate as Powell's language in his Rivers of Blood speech, which was widely regarded as racist, and Ben noted in his diary that letters began pouring in on the Powell speech, two to one against me but some very sympathetic ones saying that my speech was overdue. Harold Wilson later reprimanded Ben for this speech, accusing him of losing Labour seats in the 1970 general election. During the 1970s, Ben publicly defended Marxism, saying, The Communist Manifesto, and many other works of Marxist philosophy, have always profoundly influenced the British Labour movement and the British Labour Party, and have strengthened our understanding and enriched our thinking. It would be as unthinkable to try to construct the Labour Party without Marx as it would be to establish university faculties of astronomy, anthropology or psychology without permitting the study of Copernicus, Darwin or Freud, and still expect such faculties to be taken seriously. Labour lost the 1970 election to Edward Heath's Conservatives and upon Heath's application to join the European Economic Community, a surge in left-wing Euroscepticism emerged. Ben was stridently against membership and campaigned in favour of a referendum on the UK's membership. The Shadow Cabinet voted to support a referendum on 29 March 1972, and as a result Roy Jenkins resigned as Deputy Leader of the Labour Party. In government, 1974–1979 
In the Labour government of 1974, Ben was Secretary of State for Industry and as such increased nationalised industry pay, provided better terms and conditions for workers such as the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 and was involved in setting up worker cooperatives in firms which were struggling, the best known being at Meriden, outside Coventry, producing Triumph motorcycles. In 1975, he was appointed Secretary of State for Energy, immediately following his unsuccessful campaign for a no vote in the referendum on the UK's continued membership of the European Community Common Market. Later in his diary, 25 October 1977 Ben wrote that he loathed the EEC, he claimed it was bureaucratic and centralised, and of course it is really dominated by Germany. All the common market countries except the UK have been occupied by Germany, and they have this mixed feeling of hatred and subservience towards the Germans." Upon the death of Mao Zedong in 1976, Ben described Mao as, "...one of the greatest, if not the greatest, figures of the 20th century, a schoolteacher who transformed China, released it from civil war and foreign attack and constructed a new society there." In his diaries, adding that, he certainly towers above any 20th century figure I can think of in his philosophical contribution and military genius. On his trip to the Chinese embassy after Mao's death, Ben recorded in an earlier volume of his diaries that he was a great admirer of Mao, while also admitting that he made mistakes, because everybody does. Harold Wilson resigned as leader of the Labour Party and Prime Minister in March 1976. Ben later attributed the collapse of the Wilson government to cuts enforced on the UK by global capital, in particular the International Monetary Fund. In the resulting leadership contest Ben finished in fourth place out of the six cabinet ministers who stood, he withdrew as 11.8% of colleagues voted for him in the first ballot. Ben withdrew from the second ballot and endorsed Michael Foote, James Callaghan eventually won. Despite not receiving his support in the second and third rounds of the vote, Callaghan kept Ben on as Energy Secretary. In 1976, there was a sterling crisis, and Chancellor of the Exchequer Dennis Healy sought a loan from the International Monetary Fund. Underlining a wish to counter international market forces which seemed to penalize a larger welfare state, Ben publicly circulated the divided cabinet minutes in which a narrow majority of the Labour cabinet under Ramsay MacDonald supported a cut in unemployment benefits in order to obtain a loan from American bankers. As he highlighted, these minutes resulted in the 1931 split of the Labour Party in which MacDonald and his allies formed a national government with conservatives and liberals. Callaghan allowed Ben to put forward the alternative economic strategy, which consisted of a self-sufficient economy less dependent on low-rate fresh borrowing, but the AES, which according to opponents would have led to a siege economy, was rejected by the cabinet. In response, Ben later recalled that, I retorted that their policy was a siege economy, only they had the bankers inside the castle with all our supporters left outside, whereas my policy would have our supporters in the castle with the bankers outside." Ben blamed the winter of discontent on these cuts to socialist policies. <laughs> <laughs> Move to the left By the end of the 1970s, Ben's views had shifted to the left wing of the Labour Party. He attributed this political shift to his experience as a cabinet minister in the 1964-1970 Labour government. Ben ascribed his move to the left to four lessons. How the civil service can frustrate the policies and decisions of popularly elected governments. The centralised nature of the Labour Party which allowed the leader to run the party almost as if it were his personal kingdom. The power of industrialists and bankers to get their way by use of the crudest form of economic pressure, even blackmail, against a labor government. The power of the media, which, like the power of the medieval church, ensures that events of the day are always presented from the point of the view of those who enjoy economic privilege. As regards the power of industrialists and bankers, Ben remarked, Compared to this, the pressure brought to bear in industrial disputes by the unions is minuscule. This power was revealed even more clearly in 1976 when the International Monetary Fund secured cuts in our public expenditure. 
These four lessons led me to the conclusion that the UK is only superficially governed by MPs and the voters who elect them. Parliamentary democracy is, in truth, little more than a means of securing a periodical change in the management team, which is then allowed to preside over a system that remains in essence intact. If the British people were ever to ask themselves what power they truly enjoyed under our political system they would be amazed to discover how little it is, and some new Chartist agitation might be born and might quickly gather momentum. Ben's philosophy consisted of a form of syndicalism, state planning where necessary to ensure national competitiveness, greater democracy in the structures of the Labour Party and observance of party conference decisions. Alongside an alleged 12 Labour MPs, he spent 12 years affiliated with the Institute for Workers' Control, beginning in 1971 when he visited the Upper Clyde shipyards, arguing in 1975 for the Labour movement to intensify its discussion about industrial democracy. He was vilified by most of the press while his opponents implied and stated that a Ben-led Labour government would implement a type of Eastern European state socialism, with Edward Heath referring to Ben as Commissar Ben and others referring to Ben as a Bollinger Bolshevik. Despite this, Ben was overwhelmingly popular with Labour activists in the constituencies. A survey of delegates at the Labour Party conference in 1978 found that by large margins they supported Ben for the leadership, as well as many Benite policies. He publicly supported Sinn Féin and the unification of Ireland, although in 2005 he suggested to Sinn Féin leaders that it abandon its long standing policy of not taking seats at Westminster. Abstentionism. Sinn Féin in turn argued that to do so would recognise Britain's claim over Northern Ireland, and the Sinn Féin constitution prevented its elected members from taking their seats in any British-created institution. A supporter of the Scottish Parliament and political devolution, Ben however opposed the Scottish National Party and Scottish independence, saying, I think nationalism is a mistake. And I am half Scots and feel it would divide me in half with a knife. The thought that my mother would suddenly be a foreigner would upset me very much." In British politics during this period, the term, Benism, came into use to describe the conviction politics, economic, social and political ideology of Tony Benn, and an exponent or advocate of Benism was regarded as a Benite. In opposition, 1979–1997 In a keynote speech to the Labour Party Conference of 1980, shortly before the resignation of party leader James Callaghan and election of Michael Foote as successor, Ben outlined what he envisaged the next Labour government would do. Within days, a Labour government would gain powers to nationalise industries, control capital and implement industrial democracy. Within weeks, all powers from Brussels would be returned to Westminster, and the House of Lords would be abolished by creating 1,000 new peers and then abolishing the peerage. Ben received tumultuous applause. On 25 January 1981, Roy Jenkins, David Owen, Shirley Williams and Bill Rogers known collectively as the Gang of Four, launched the Council for Social Democracy, which became the Social Democratic Party in March. The Gang of Four left the Labour Party because of what they perceived to be the influence of the militant tendency and the Benite hard left within the party. Ben was highly critical of the SDP, saying that Britain has had SDP governments for the past 25 years. Ben stood against Dennis Healy, the party's incumbent deputy leader, triggering the 1981 deputy leadership election, disregarding an appeal from Michael Foote to either stand for the leadership or abstain from inflaming the party's divisions. Ben defended his decision insisting that it was, "...not about personalities, but about policies." The result was announced on 27 September 1981, Healy retained his position by a margin of barely 1%. The decision of several soft-left MPs, including Neil Kinnock, to abstain triggered the split of the socialist campaign group from the left of the Tribune group. After Argentina invaded the Falkland Islands in April 1982, Ben argued that the dispute should be settled by the United Nations and that the British government should not send a task force to recapture the islands. The task force was sent, and following the Falklands War, they were back in British control by mid-June. In a debate in the Commons just after the Falklands were recaptured, Ben's demand for a full analysis of the costs in life, equipment and money in this tragic and unnecessary war was rejected by Margaret Thatcher, who stated that 
he would not enjoy the freedom of speech that he put to such excellent use unless people had been prepared to fight for it." For the 1983 election Ben's Bristol South East constituency was abolished by boundary changes, and he lost to Michael Cox in the selection of a candidate to stand in the new winnable seat of Bristol South. Rejecting offers from the new seat of Livingston in Scotland, Ben contested Bristol East, losing to the Conservatives Jonathan Said in June 1983. In a by-election, Ben was elected as the MP for Chesterfield, the next Labour seat to fall vacant, after Eric Varley had left the Commons to head Colite. On the day of the by-election, 1 March 1984, the Sun newspaper ran a hostile feature article, Ben on the Couch, which purported to be the opinions of an American psychiatrist. In the period since Ben's defeat in Bristol, Michael Foote had stepped down after the general election which saw a return of only 209 Labour MPs and was succeeded in October of that year by Neil Kinnock, newly elected to a mining seat. Ben was a supporter of the 1984-85 UK miners' strike, which was beginning when he returned to the Commons, and of his long-standing friend, the National Union of Mineworkers leader Arthur Scargill. However, some miners considered Ben's 1977 industry reforms to have caused problems during the strike, firstly, that they led to huge wage differences and distrust between miners of different regions, and secondly that the controversy over balloting miners for these reforms made it unclear as to whether a ballot was needed for a strike or whether it could be deemed as a regional matter, in the same way that the 1977 reforms had been. Ben also spoke at a militant tendency rally held in 1984, saying, The labor movement is not engaged in a personalized battle against individual cabinet ministers, nor do we seek to win public support by arguing that the crisis could be ended by the election of a new and more humane team of ministers who are better qualified to administer capitalism. We are working for a majority labor government, elected on a socialist program, as decided by conference. This guest appearance was considered one reason why Ben did not become a member of Labour's shadow cabinet. In June 1985, three months after the miners admitted defeat and ended their strike, Ben introduced the Miners' Amnesty General Pardon Bill into the Commons, which would have extended an amnesty to all miners imprisoned during the strike. This would have included two men convicted of murder later reduced to manslaughter for the killing of David Wilkie, a taxi driver driving a non-striking miner to work in South Wales during the strike. Ben stood for election as party leader in 1988, against Neil Kinnock, following Labour's third successive defeat in the 1987 general election, losing by a substantial margin, and received only about 11% of the vote. In May 1989 he made an extended appearance on Channel 4's late-night discussion program After Dark, alongside among others Lord Dacre and Miles Copeland. During the Gulf War, Ben visited Baghdad in order to try and persuade Saddam Hussein to release the hostages who had been captured. Ben supported various LGBT social movements, which were then known as gay liberation. Ben had voted in favor of decriminalization in 1967. Talking about Section 28 of the 1988 Local Government Act, a piece of anti-gay legislation preventing the promotion of homosexuality, Ben said, if the sense of the word promote can be read across from describe, every murder play promotes murder, every war play promotes war, every drama involving the eternal triangle promotes adultery, and Mr. Richard Branson's condom campaign promotes fornication. The House had better be very careful before it gives to judges, who come from a narrow section of society, the power to interpret, promote. Ben later voted for the repeal of Section 28 during the first term of Tony Blair's new Labour government, and voted in favour of equalising the age of consent. In 1990 he proposed a Margaret Thatcher global repeal bill, which he said, could go through both houses in 24 hours. It would be easy to reverse the policies and replace the personalities—the process has begun—but the rotten values that have been propagated from the platform of political power in Britain during the past ten years will be an infection—a virulent strain of right-wing capitalist thinking which it will take time to overcome. In 1991, with Labour still in opposition and a general election due by June 1992, he proposed the Commonwealth of Britain Bill, abolishing the monarchy in favour of the United Kingdom becoming a democratic, federal and secular Commonwealth, a republic with a written constitution. It was read in Parliament a number of times until his retirement at the 2001 election, but never achieved a second reading. 
He presented an account of his proposal in Common Sense, a new constitution for Britain. In 1992, Tony Benn also received a Pipe Smoker of the Year award, claiming in his acceptance speech that, Pipe smoking stopped you going to war. In 1991, Benn reiterated his opposition to the European Commission and highlighted an alleged democratic deficit in the institution, saying, some people genuinely believe that we shall never get social justice from the British government, but we shall get it from Jacques Delors. They believe that a good king is better than a bad parliament. I have never taken that view." This argument has also been used by many on the right-wing Eurosceptic wing of the Conservative Party, such as Daniel Hannan Mep. Jonathan Friedland writes in The Guardian that for Tony Benn, even benign rule by a monarch was worthless because the king's whim could change and there'd be nothing you could do about it. <laughs> Prior to retirement, 1997–2001 In 1997, the Labour Party under the leadership of Tony Blair won the general election in a landslide, after 18 years of Conservative Party rule. Despite later calling Labour under Tony Blair, the idea of a Conservative group who had taken over Labour, and saying, Blair set up a new political party, New Labour. Ben's political diaries free at last show that Ben was initially somewhat sympathetic to Blair, welcoming a change of government. Ben supported the introduction of the national minimum wage, and welcomed the progress towards peace and security in Northern Ireland particularly under Mo Mullum. He was supportive of the extra public money given to public services in the new labour years but believed it to be under the guise of privatisation. Overall, his concluding judgment on new labour is highly critical. He describes its evolution as a way of retaining office by abandoning socialism and distancing the party from the trade union movement, adopting a presidentialist style of politics, overriding the concept of the collective ministerial responsibility by reducing the power of the cabinet, eliminated any effective influence from the annual conference of the Labour Party, and hinged its foreign policy on support for one of the worst presidents in U.S. history. Ben strongly objected to the immoral bombing of Iraq in December 1998, saying, Aren't Arabs terrified? Aren't Iraqis terrified? Don't Arab and Iraqi women weep when their children die? Does bombing strengthen their determination? Every member of parliament tonight who votes for the government motion will be consciously and deliberately accepting the responsibility for the deaths of innocent people if the war begins, as I fear it will. Several months prior to his retirement, Ben was a signatory to a letter, alongside Nikki Adams Legal Action for Women, Ian MacDonald QC, Gareth Pierce, and other legal professionals, that was published in The Guardian newspaper on of February 2001, condemning raids of more than 50 brothels in the central London area of Soho. At the time, a police spokesman said, as far as we know, this is the biggest simultaneous crackdown on brothels and prostitution in this country in recent times. The arrest of 28 people in an operation that involved around 110 police officers. The letter read, In the name of protecting women from trafficking, about 40 women, including a woman from Iraq, were arrested, detained and in some cases summarily removed from Britain. If any of these women have been trafficked, they deserve protection and resources, not punishment by expulsion. Having forced women into destitution, the government first criminalized those who begged. Now it is trying to use prostitution as a way to make deportation of the vulnerable more acceptable. We will not allow such injustice to go unchallenged. Topic: <laughs> Retirement and final years, 2001 to 2014. Ben chose not to seek re-election at the 2001 general election, saying he was "...leaving Parliament in order to spend more time on politics." Along with former Prime Minister Edward Heath, Ben was permitted by the Speaker to continue using the House of Commons Library and Members' Refreshment Facilities. Shortly after his retirement, he became the President of the Stop the War Coalition. He became a leading figure of the British opposition to the war in Afghanistan from 2001 and the Iraq War, and in February 2003 he travelled to Baghdad to meet Saddam Hussein. 
The interview was broadcast on British television. He spoke against the war at the February 2003 protest in London organised by the Stop the War Coalition, with police saying it was the biggest ever demonstration in the UK with about 750,000 marchers, and the organisers estimating nearly a million people participating. In February 2004 and 2008, he was re elected president of the Stop the War Coalition. He toured with a one man stage show and appeared a few times each year in a two man show with folk singer Roy Bailey. In 2003, his show with Bailey was voted Best Live Act at the BBC Radio 2 Folk Awards. In 2002, he opened the Left Field stage at the Glastonbury Festival. He continued to speak at each subsequent festival, attending one of his speeches was described as a Glastonbury rite of passage. In October 2003, he was a guest of British Airways on the last scheduled Concorde flight from New York to London. In June 2005, he was a panelist on a special edition of BBC One's Question Time edited entirely by a school-age film crew selected by a BBC competition. On the 21st of June 2005, Ben presented a program on democracy as part of the Channel 5 series Big Ideas That Changed the World. He presented a left-wing view of democracy as the means to pass power from the wallet to the ballot. He argued that traditional social democratic values were under threat in an increasingly globalized world in which powerful institutions such as the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank and the European Commission are unelected and unaccountable to those whose lives they affect daily. On 27 September 2005, Ben became ill whilst attending the annual Labour Party conference in Brighton and was taken by ambulance to the Royal Sussex County Hospital after being treated by paramedics on the scene at the Brighton Centre. Ben reportedly fell and struck his head. He was kept in hospital for observation and was described as being in a comfortable condition. He was subsequently fitted with an artificial pacemaker to help regulate his heartbeat. In a list compiled by the magazine New Statesman in 2006, he was voted 12th in the list of heroes of our time. In September 2006, Ben joined the Time to Go. Demonstration in Manchester the day before the final Labour Party conference with Tony Blair as leader of the Labour Party, with the aim of persuading the government to withdraw troops from Iraq, to refrain from attacking Iran and to reject replacing the Trident missile and submarines with a new system. He spoke to the demonstrators in the rally afterwards. In 2007, he appeared in an extended segment in the Michael Moore film Sicko giving comments about democracy, social responsibility and healthcare, notably. If we can find the money to kill people, we can find the money to help people. A poll by the BBC2 The Daily Politics programme in January 2007 selected Ben as the UK's political hero, with 38% of the vote, narrowly defeating Margaret Thatcher, who had 35%. For the 2007 Labour Party leadership election, Ben backed the left wing MP John McDonnell in his unsuccessful bid. In September 2007, Ben called for the government to hold a referendum on the EU reform treaty. In October 2007, aged 82, and when it appeared that a general election was about to be held, Ben reportedly announced that he wanted to stand, having written to his local constituency Labour Party offering himself as a prospective candidate for the newly drawn Kensington seat. His main opponent would have been the incumbent Conservative MP for the predecessor seat of Kensington and Chelsea, Malcolm Rifkin. However, there was no election held in 2007, and so the boundary changes did not take effect until the eventual election in 2010, when Ben was not a candidate and the new seat was won by Rifkind. In early 2008, Ben appeared on Scottish singer-songwriter Colin McIntyre's album The Water, reading a poem he had written himself. In September 2008, he appeared on the DVD release for The Doctor Who Story The War Machines with a vignette discussing the post office tower. He became the second Labour politician, after Roy Hattersley, to appear on a Doctor Who DVD. Conservatives Daniel Hannan, Douglas Carswell, and David Cameron praised Ben in 2008. In their book The Plan, Carswell and Hannan write that, Historically, it was the left that sought to disperse power among the people. It was the cause of the levelers and the chartists and the suffragettes, the cause of religious toleration and meritocracy, of the secret ballot and universal education. Adding, these days, though, the radical cause should have different targets. The elites have altered in character and composition. The citizen is far less likely to be impacted by the decisions of dukes or bishops than by those of nice or his local education authority. 
The employees of these and similar agencies are, today, the unaccountable Crown Office holders against whom earlier generations of radicals would have railed. Yet, with some exceptions, among whom, in a special place of honour, stands Tony Benn, few contemporary British leftists show any interest in dispersing power when doing so would mean challenging public sector monopolies. Cameron also said in 2008 that, alongside George Orwell's 1984, Benn's arguments for democracy was a very powerful book which makes the important point that we vest power in people who are elected, and that we can get rid of, rather than those we can't." Ben was invited by Richard Branson and Peter Gabriel to join the Elders, an advocacy group composed of Nelson Mandela, Mary Robinson and Jimmy Carter. At the Stop the War Conference 2009, he described the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan as "...imperialist wars." and discussed the killing of American and Allied troops by Iraqi or foreign insurgents, questioning whether they were in fact freedom fighters, and comparing the insurgents to a British dad's army, saying, If you are invaded you have a right to self-defense, and this idea that people in Iraq and Afghanistan who are resisting the invasion are militant Muslim extremists is a complete bloody lie. I joined Dad's army when I was 16, and if the Germans had arrived, I tell you, I could use a bayonet, a rifle, a revolver, and if I'd seen a German officer having a meal I'd have tossed a grenade through the window. Would I have been a freedom fighter or a terrorist? In an interview published in Dartford Living in September 2009, Ben was critical of the government's decision to delay the findings of the Iraq War inquiry until after the general election, stating that people can take into account what the inquiry has reported on but they've deliberately pushed it beyond the election. Government is responsible for explaining what it has done and I don't think we were told the truth. Quote. He also stated that local government was strangled by Margaret Thatcher and had not been liberated by New Labour. In 2009, Ben was admitted to hospital and an evening with Tony Benn, scheduled to take place at London's Cadogan Hall, was cancelled. He performed his show, The Writing on the Wall, with Roy Bailey at St Mary's Church, Ashford, Kent, in September 2011, as part of the arts venue's first revelation St Mary's season. In July 2011 Ben was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Glamorgan, Wales. Tony Ben headed the Coalition of Resistance, a group which was opposed to the UK austerity programme. In interviews in 2010 with Amy Goodman on Democracy Now! and 2013 with Afshan Ratansi on RTUK, Ben claimed that the actions of New Labour in the lead-up to and aftermath of the Iraq War were such that the former Prime Minister Tony Blair should be tried for war crimes. Ben also claimed in 2010 that Blair had lost the trust of the nation regarding the war in Iraq. In November 2011, it was reported that Ben had moved out of his home in Holland Park Avenue, London, into a smaller flat nearby that benefited from a warden. In 2012, Ben was awarded an honorary degree from Goldsmiths, University of London. He was also the honorary president of the Goldsmiths Students' Union, who successfully campaigned for him to retract comments dismissing the Julian Assange rape allegations. In February 2013, Ben was among those who gave their support to the People's Assembly in a letter published by The Guardian newspaper. He gave a speech at the People's Assembly conference held at Westminster Central Hall on the 22nd of June 2013. In 2013, Tony Ben reiterated his previous opposition to European integration. Speaking to the Oxford Union on the alleged overshadowing of the EU debate by UKIP and Tory backbenchers, he said, I took the view that having fought Europeans in the Second World War that we should now work with them, and cooperate, and that was my first thought about it. Then how I saw how the European Union was developing, it was very obvious that what they had in mind was not democratic. And the way that Europe has developed is that the bankers and the multinational corporations have got very powerful positions, and if you come in on their terms, they will tell you what you can and cannot do. And that is unacceptable. My view about the European Union has always been not that I am hostile to foreigners, but that I am in favor of democracy. I think they're building an empire there, they want us to be a part of their empire and I don't want that. Illness and death In 1990, Ben was diagnosed with chronic lymphatic leukemia and given three or four years to live. At this time, he kept the news of his leukemia from everyone except his immediate family. Ben said, When you're in Parliament, you can't describe your medical condition. 
People immediately start wondering what your majority is and when there will be a by-election. They're very brutal. This was revealed in 2002 with the release of his 1990 to 2001 diaries. Ben suffered a stroke in 2012 and spent much of the following year in hospital. He was reported to be seriously ill in hospital in February 2014. Ben died at home on the 14th of March 2014, surrounded by his family, less than a month shy of his 89th birthday. Ben's funeral took place on the 27th of March 2014 at St Margaret's Church, Westminster. His body had lain in rest at St. Mary Undercroft in the Palace of Westminster the night before the funeral service. The service ended with the singing of the Red Flag. His body was then cremated. The ashes were expected to be buried alongside those of his wife at the family home near Steeple, Essex. Figures from across the political spectrum praised Ben following his death, and the leaders of all three major political parties the Conservatives, Labour, and the Liberal Democrats in the United Kingdom paid tributes to Ben on his death. David Cameron conservative leader and prime minister said He was an extraordinary man a great writer a brilliant speaker extraordinary in parliament and a great life of public and political and parliamentary service I mean I disagreed with most of what he said but he was always engaging and interesting and you were never bored when reading or listening to him and the country a great campaigner a great writer and someone who I'm sure whose words will be followed keenly for many many years to come Deputy Prime Minister, Nick Clegg called Ben a "...astonishing, iconic figure," and a "...veteran parliamentarian, he was a great writer, he had great warmth and he had great conviction his political life will be looked back on with affection and admiration." Leader of the Opposition and Labour leader Ed Miliband, who knew Ben personally as a family friend, said, I think Tony Ben will be remembered as a champion of the powerless, as a conviction politician, as somebody of deep principle and integrity. The thing about Tony Ben is that you always knew what he stood for, and who he stood up for. And I think that's why he was admired right across the political spectrum. There are people who agreed with him and disagreed with him, including in my own party, but I think people admired that sense of conviction and integrity that shone through from Tony Benn. <laughs> <laughs> Diaries and biographies Benn was a prolific diarist, nine volumes of his diaries have been published. The final volume was published in 2013. Collections of his speeches and writings were published as Arguments for Socialism 1979, Arguments for Democracy 1981, both edited by Chris Mullin, Fighting Back 1988, and with Andrew Hood Common Sense 1993, as well as Free Radical, New Century Essays 2004. In August 2003, London DJ Charles Bailey created an album of Ben's speeches ISBN 1-904734-03-0 set to ambient groove. He made public several episodes of audio diaries he made during his time in Parliament and after retirement, entitled The Ben Tapes, broadcast originally on BBC Radio 4. Short series have been played periodically on BBC Radio 4 Extra. A major biography was written by Jad Adams and published by Macmillan in 1992. It was updated to cover the intervening 20 years and reissued by Biteback Publishing in 2011. Tony Benn, a biography, ISBN 0 2 A more recent, semi authorized biography with a foreword by Benn was published in 2001. David Powell, Tony Benn, A Political Life, Continuum Books ISBN 978-0826464156. An autobiography, Dare to be a Daniel, Then and Now, Hutchinson ISBN 978-0099471530, was published in 2004. There are substantial essays on Ben in the Dictionary of Labor Biography by Philip Whitehead, Greg Rosen eds, Politicos Publishing, 2001 ISBN 978-1902301181 and in Labor Forces, from Ernie Bevan to Gordon Brown, Kevin Jefferies ed, I.B. Tories Publishing, 2002 ISBN 978-1860647437. Michael Moore dedicates his book Mike's Election Guide 2008 ISBN 978-0141039817 to Ben, with the words, For Tony Ben, keep teaching us. Topic. 
Topic: Plaques. During his final years in Parliament, Ben placed three plaques within the Houses of Parliament. Two are in a room between the central lobby and strangers' gallery that holds a permanent display about the suffragettes. The first was placed in 1995. The second was placed in 1996 and is dedicated to all who work within the Houses of Parliament. The third is dedicated to suffragette Emily Wilding Davison and was placed in the broom cupboard next to the Undercroft Chapel within the Palace of Westminster, where Davison is said to have hidden during the 1911 census in order to establish her address as the House of Commons. In 2011, Ben unveiled a plaque in Highbury, North London, to commemorate the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. Legacy In Bristol, where Ben first served as a Member of Parliament, a number of tributes exist in his honour. A bust of him was unveiled in Bristol's City Hall in 2005. In 2012 Transport House on Victoria Street, headquarters of Unite the Union's regional office, was officially renamed Tony Ben House and opened by Ben himself. As of 2015 he appears, alongside other famous people associated with the city, on the reverse of the Bristol Pounds Pound B5 banknote. Ben told the Socialist Review in 2007 that, I'd like to have on my gravestone. He encouraged us. I'm proud to have been in the parliament that introduced the health service, the welfare state and voted against means testing. I did my maiden speech on nationalizing the steel industry, put down the first motion for the boycott of South African goods, and resigned from the shadow cabinet in 1958 because of their support for nuclear weapons. I think you do plant a few acorns, and I have lived to see one or two trees growing, gay rights, freedom of information, cnd. I'm not claiming them for myself but you feel you have encouraged other people and see the arguments developing. I'm not ashamed of making mistakes. I've made a million mistakes and they're all in the diary. When we edit the diary, which is cut to around 10%, every mistake has to be printed because people look to see if you do. I would be ashamed if I thought I'd ever said anything I didn't believe to get on, but making mistakes is part of life, isn't it? Tony Benn has been cited as being a key mentor to future leader of the Labour Party Jeremy Corbyn, with his shadow chancellor John McDonnell commenting that they would discuss everything under the sun. Jeremy was very close to Tony right up until the end. Corbyn was elected as leader of the Labour Party a little over a year after Ben's death, an act which Hillary Benn said would have made his father feel thrilled. <laughs> Styles Anthony Wedgwood Benn, ESQ, 1925-12 January 1942 the Honorable Anthony Wedgwood Ben, the 12th of January 1942 to the 30th of November 1950. The Honorable Anthony Wedgwood Ben, MP, the 30th of November 1950 to the 17th of November 1960. The Right Honorable the Viscount Stansgate, the 17th of November 1960 to the 31st of July 1963. Anthony Wedgwood Ben, ESQ, the 31st of July to the 20th of August 1963. Anthony Wedgwood Ben, ESQ, MP, the 20th of August 1963-1964. The Right Honourable Anthony Wedgwood Ben, MP, 1964 October 1973. The Right Honourable Tony Ben, MP, October 1973 to the 9th of June 1983. The Right Honorable Tony Ben, the 9th of June 1983 to the 1st of March 1984. The Right Honorable Tony Ben, MP, the 1st of March 1984 to the 7th of June 2001. The Right Honorable Tony Ben, the 7th of June 2001 to the 14th of March 2014. Topic: Bibliography. <inaudible> 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 Marr, Andrew. 2007. A History of Modern Britain. Macmillan. ISBN 978-0-330-51147-6. 
Speeches, Spokesman Books 1974, ISBN 0851240917 Levelers and the English Democratic Tradition, Spokesman Books 1976, ISBN 978-0-85124-633-8 Why America Needs Democratic Socialism, Spokesman Books 1978, ISBN 978-0-85124-266-8 Prospects, Amalgamated Union of Engineering Workers, Technical, Administrative and Supervisory Section 1979, Case for Constitutional Civil Service, Institute for Workers Control 1980, ISBN 978-0-901740-67-0 Case for Party Democracy, Institute for Workers Control 1980, ISBN 978-0-901740-70-0 Arguments for Socialism, Penguin Books 1980, ISBN 978 0 7 and Chris Mullen, Arguments for Democracy, Jonathan Cape 1981, ISBN 978-0-224-01878-4 European Unity, A New Perspective, Spokesman Books 1981, ISBN 978-0-85124-326-9 Parliament and Power, Agenda for a Free Society, Verso Books 1982, ISBN 978-0-86 0910572 and Andrew Hood Common Sense New Constitution for Britain Hutchinson 1993 Free Radical New Century Essays Continuum International Publishing 2004 ISBN 9780826474001 Dare to be a Daniel Then and Now Hutchinson 2004 ISBN 9780091799991 Letters to My Grandchildren Thoughts on the Future Arrow Books 2010, ISBN 978-0-09-953909-4out of the Wilderness, Diaries 1963-67, Hutchinson 1987, ISBN 978-0-09-170660-9 Office Without Power, Diaries 1968-72, Hutchinson 1988, ISBN 978-0-09-173647-7 Against the Tide, Diaries 1973-76, Hutchinson 1989, ISBN 978-0-09-173775-7 Conflicts of Interest, Diaries 1977-80, Hutchinson 1990, ISBN 978-0-09-174321-5 The End of an Era, Diaries 1980-90, Hutchinson 1992, ISBN 978-0-09-174857-9 Years of Hope, Diaries 1940-62, Hutchinson 1994, ISBN 978-0-09-178534-5 The Ben Diaries, Single Volume Edition 1940-90, Hutchinson 1995, ISBN 978-0-09-179223-7 Free at Last, Diaries 1991-2001, Hutchinson 2002, ISBN 978-0-09-179352-4 More Time for Politics, Diaries 2001-2007, Hutchinson 2007, ISBN 978-0-09-951705-4 a Blaze of Autumn Sunshine, The Last Diaries, Hutchinson 2013, ISBN 978-0-09-194387-5 See also Labour Representation Committee 2004 Republicanism in the United Kingdom Socialist Campaign Group